Hello, my name is Kurt Schwer, and this is Research Tools 2011, video number 6, Bash Part 2, Variables. And this is for the UNH Center for Coastal and Ocean Mapping Joint Hydrographic Center Research Tools class. And today I'm going to talk you through variables in Bash. So let's go into a terminal in Ubuntu, and here we have Bash. And we're going to talk about how to set variables and then work with them to get extra stuff done. We're going to start off with a variable name. If I say ship, ship name equals Nancy Foster, we actually get an error. And in fact, Bash is very picky about its variables. When you set a variable, you use the equal sign with no spaces. And then we say echo dollar ship name. And we get back Nancy Foster. The thing to note here is that when you set the variable, you don't need the uh, dollar sign. And when you use the variable, you'll actually need the dollar sign. And if you're trying to use that variable within something else, we have to protect it necessarily with uh, what are called curly braces. And so if we want to say something else, we now can have that variable inside of a sentence and if it, if there's no space around this say like this we wouldn't actually need those curly braces so the we'll use those curly braces later on inside of uh, a number of little scripts and let's take a, a look at what happens if we have processes that we start from the shell so we're gonna say ship name Rudy for another ship name. And if we start a child process, for example, bash, but first we're going to see that if we can tell what level of bash we're on, so echo dollar shell level, and I press tab to complete that. And we're at level one. If we start a second bash, we'll now see echo dollar shell level, and we're now at two. So this is a child process that's running inside of the first bash. And we can say echo dollar ship name. Unfortunately, our variable has not made it along with our new shell, so it can't use that inside of, of this new shell, or it could be a script or some other program. So let's exit back out of that. If we take a look, our shell levels back to one. And now if we say export ship name equals research icebreaker Palmer. And now if we start a new bash and we say echo dollar shell level, we see we're at level two. And if we say echo dollar ship name, we now have the Palmer following us along. Let's exit out of that. So that's the basics of setting variables and keeping them around. Uh, typically, if you're just using them inside of a loop, you don't need that export. But if you want that variable to go further, then you're going to need the export. Let's take a look at the environment. And Bash has a whole bunch of variables that it needs to keep around. We can see these with a program called print env. I'm going to pipe it to less. That's the vertical bar right here is the pipe. And going to less, which is a pager that's going to show us a bit at a time. We press enter. And we've got uh, a whole bunch of variables here. And we'll go through some of them later on. And so it shows you that it's keeping track of a lot of information for you. Let's take a quick look at some of the important ones. Uh, take a look at echo dollar path. This is where it searches for programs. So you can manipulate that and add extra locations like places for your own scripts. You can ask it which version of bash you're running. So echo bash version. So here we're in bash version 4.2. And if somewhere down the road, bash 5 comes out and there's features that are new, you can look at the documentation and figure out whether or not that feature you're looking at is available in this particular version of the shell. Um, we can take a look at the history size, so echo hist size. And in this case it's set to a thousand, and so if I say head history pipe head, that's the first 10. We can see we've got our history going way back. And if we pipe tail to see the last most recent bit, we're now getting pretty close to that 1000 uh, entry 
list and it will start dropping things from the beginning once we get there. So it's important to be able to set those things and keep, keep control of how much you want to keep around. Maybe a thousand is enough for you, maybe it's too much. Uh, let's see, you can ask what user you are. So in this case it's research tools, that's not very exciting. But if I SSH to another host, so I'll SSH to my username at ccom.unh.edu. And I'm logged in, I can say echo dollar user. An important one here when you're logging into multiple machines and doing things like that is echo dollar host, sorry, host name. And this is a computer at CCOM. And if I exit out back to my virtual machine and we say echo dollar host name, it's back to Ubuntu. And this is a, a host name that isn't really attached to a real computer, this is just in the virtual machine. Uh, you can also ask where you are, so we can say you can use the command pwd or you can check the variable pwd print working directory. And so if we go into cd class and echo dollar pwd, you're now in class. cd minus takes you back to the previous directory that you were in. It's a handy little tool, so cd minus will take you back to class, cd minus takes you back home. And for those of you who speak a different language, there are ways in Linux to set the language and have a lot of these prompts come out in your native tongue. I have no idea how to do that because I only speak English. I'm not fortunate enough to be fluent in anything else. So echo dollar lang will actually tell us that we're in English and the US version of English and that we're using the UTF-8 or one byte character set. So if you're using a Linux version for, for another language, you'll see that be different. And uh, we can also ask which shell we're in. This might not always be bash. If you're in somebody else's environment and they're running your script, you can check to make sure that you're actually in bash and the features that you need are available. Now, since in this class we've been talking about using the Emacs editor, uh, it defaults to VI for most tools that use an editor. So if we say less example dot bash and in less if we press the V key it actually spawns an editor and here we're stuck in GNU Nano which we are not going to be using. So we'll do a control X for exit and quit Q is quit and we want to actually set uh, the editor variable to tell it that we want to use Emacs. So we can say export editor equals Emacs. So now let's take a look with less and that example dot bash. And if we press the V key, we should pop up uh, a whole Emacs window with our file that we're working on. Pretty handy. Uh, if we quit out of that, but perhaps you don't want to actually have that pop up the full graphical Emacs. You can do dash NW, which means no window, don't spawn a full window. So let's try this one out. So let's go back into less. And now if we press the V key for the editor, you'll see that Emacs is started up in a small window within the terminal and is not creating some extra environment. So I'm going to do control X, control C to quit out of that and a Q to quit out of less. Now what we really want is we want an outside Emacs that keeps running that we can tell it please go edit this file for us. And if we start an Emacs up here, shrink this up so it's all on the screen. And inside of Emacs we can do a meta x server start, press enter. We now have it running in sort of a server mode where it's listening for requests to edit files. And if we go over here and we say uh, Emacs client. This is a tool on the command line that will tell Emacs, please go edit a file. So edit example, create a simpler one, hello.bash. So now it's opened up hello.bash and it's told us at the bottom down here that we can do a control X pound and that will declare that we're done editing. So let's go create a quick script. Bang, 
bin slash bash echo hello. Now control X and then a pound, the number sign. We do want to save it, so yes. The file closed and we're back at the shell. And if we do ls-l hello and source hello, we now have a script. If we don't want it to wait around for us, we can change that Emacs client to say, let's ask it, help. And if we look up here, there is dash dash no wait. So if we do Emacs client dash dash no dash wait, and then hello dot bash. Note that our Emacs is currently in the welcome screen. Press enter and Emacs bring, comes to the front and it brings up that file for us. Now if we note back here, we've jumped right back to the command line without waiting around for editing it. So what we can do now is export editor equals, and then we can say Emacs client uh, dash dash no dash wait. And it will kill this guy, control X K, make that go away. Okay, so now if we go into less and we say hello dot bash. Now if I press the V key to edit this file, it brings up um, Emacs over here and it got very confused. So we're gonna ignore that. So that editor is now set and we'll use that in later parts of the class. And I'll go through setting up a lot of configuration in the next Emacs tutorial. Okay, so let's talk about for loops. In, the for, in a for loop, we're gonna walk over a bunch of variables and we're gonna see that um, we can loop through and call things multiple times with a different value on a variable each time. So I'm gonna bring up example.bash with our example for loop. So it's for, creating the for loop, our here is gonna be our variable. So each time through the loop, our is gonna be set to a different value. In says, okay, we're ready to give you the list of things that we're gonna loop over. And then we can put a bunch of things and they can be numbers, they can be strings. So we can say hello. Do starts the beginning of our loop. Echo is one command that we're gonna do in the loop. So we can say echo and just a blank one here to make a new line. So you'll see each loop through. And we can maybe even say end and echo start. So if we source that, source example.bash, we get a whole lot of stuff. It's way too confusing, but you can see each block here. So here's one block and here's the next block. And then there's the hello at the end. So let's remove those echoes because they're too confusing. Try that again, source, and we'll see one through six plus hello at the end. Now we can also copy this go over here and edit paste. And we can do it from the command line, press enter, and it works just the same. Now, one thing you'll notice if you hit the up arrow to go back to a previous command, it's gonna pack it all into one line. And there's a trick in the shell that the semicolon right here's one right there and there's one right here those are the equivalent of a new blank line of going down to the next line so this is effectively one line starting at the four the hello then the semicolon starts the new line do and you actually didn't need a blank line between the do and the echo and then here's the command we're going to run inside of our loop so if we run that it looks exactly the same now you can use that for all kinds of things like you could rename every single file in your directory. For example, oftentimes if you've got uh, files named .jpeg and you want them to be called .jpg for JPEG picture and it's confusing some of your programs, you could loop over even 10,000 files pretty quickly and rename them all. It's very handy. Now the next one I'm going to show you is the if statement. And in the if statement, we're going to use two different uh, programs to illustrate what's going on with if. If is definitely syntactically annoying. As you type it, it, there's some confusing syntax that you'll 
you'll see in a moment. But we're going to start off simple, and we're going to use two programs. One is called bin true, and this program always returns true. But how do we know that? The shell has a return code from each uh, program and it's hard to know what what it's saying just from looking at this you have to know that you can type echo dollar question mark and this will always tell you the return code from the last program so in bash unfortunately zero is true which is the exact opposite of just about everything else and slash bin slash false is going to return us a false code and then we can say echo dollar question mark, and one happens to be false in the shell. So we can use this to construct an if statement, and we can say if bin slash true, enter, and then to start, instead of saying do, we say then, and inside the block we can say echo yes, this is true, which should get printed out because bin true is always true, and then to finish up, instead of saying done, we say phi, which is if backwards. The original author was being very clever. So yep, it's true. If we hit the up arrow, again, it's collapsed it all to one line, so it's a little bit annoying, but hopefully you can read that. If I'm going to change that true to false, we should see that the echo is not run. So then there's no echo. So that's the basics of an if test. And the reason I want you to definitely know this one is we're going to go take a look at the bash RC. So if we go into Emacs, or actually let's do it from our Emacs client. No wait dot bash RC. So we're going to edit our bash RC. And in here, you're going to see a number of if tests. So I'm going to do meta greater than to jump to the bottom of the file. And here, for example, is an if block where it's testing to see if the file dot bash underscore aliases exists with a dash f in here. And if that file exists, it's going to use this crazy command, the dot and then the file name. Dot is equivalent to running source. So if we do ls-l and we had with source hello.bash is the equivalent of period or full stop and hello.bash. The dot is definitely harder to notice in text, so I recommend probably not using it. But while we've got this open, let's go ahead and add our editor in here and we'll say export editor equals Emacs client. And we'll just leave the no wait off for now. And what that will do is give us the ability to run Emacs client whenever we ask for an editor. And the bash RC is run every time a new shell is created, so that will follow us around even if the, the virtual machine is rebooted or if we start a new terminal. So this is very handy. Save that with Control X, Control S, and then we'll go ahead and kill it in Control X, Control, and then no control, and then K, and then we press Enter, and that's now gone. So that would be a if loop or an if block. We can also do some handy things with something called command substitutions. So if we say echo and then we run the command date, you can start building up a date command or some sort of echo statement with whatever you want <coughs> and run it inside of <coughs> the shell. So we can create a command that's got something that we want to have inside. We can say, for example, date, and date's a really cool command to know. It, it is very helpful. So we can say year percent %m and then percent %d. This is going to say capital Y is year. Please give us the month and then the day as numbers. So we can even build a hour, minute, and second. So that's a, a great date to have as a timestamp if you want to create a file name with that. And we can then also say we'd like it to be UTC because we should always be logging data in UTC. So there's our date in UTC and you can see that there's a four hour time change between where I'm sitting and UTC. 
So we can say echo puts uh, the back quote around this and today or how we'll say now is this is the time. And so we've created a sentence. And if we want to put that into, for example, a log file, we could say log dot, and now I can do select that, edit, copy, edit, paste. And I'll do an ls-ltr, where t is sort by time and r is reverse that sort order. And you see down here we have a log file with our timestamp right in here. It's very handy. And you could create, you could even make it have like your username in there. So we could say dollar user dot, and you can build whatever you want. So ls-ltr. easier okay so in here you can see we've got our username research tools added and if we hadn't done these parentheses or these curly braces around this we might have had trouble with the variable being indistinguishable from the rest of the command now one thing to know is that the back tick is the old style that you're not supposed to use anymore and I always use it by default so what you really want to know is how to do it the way that's now the new improved way and that's run date with parentheses around it so we can say um, plus percent y and there's the year so you can now build things up however you want and that will help you with managing data on your system It's also possible to do simple math, and this is where we see that the shell syntax is fairly confusing and that we'd rather be in Python right now. But with two, per, two parentheses around some value, we can do some math. So if you need to calculate some number, you can do a little calculator on the command line. Very handy for lots of little background scripts, but this pretty pretty well demonstrates that we'd rather be in Python with a language that has less quirkiness to it. It doesn't have the beginning if with a then and then the phi as opposed to the for loop which has a do and a done. Everything in Bash, it's been around for a long time and people didn't understand how important it was to have a very regular syntax. So here you have to remember something different for for loops and if loops, Python will be much more uniform. Now, um, I'd like to show you how to uh, open up a program from the command line. So xdg open is a key one to know, and we can say 2000 and then tab, and that'll give us this image that we have in our directory. So xdg open will bring up a picture in this case. And when you see things like this with all these little warnings and errors, you can just ignore them. They're debugging stuff that should have been turned off inside of the display program. If we go back to our for loop and we'd like to rename this JPEG, I'm going to walk you through creating a quick script that will do that. And we want to convert that to a PNG image. So we'll loop over all of our images, pretend there's more than one image for file in star.jpeg, so give me all the JPEGs, do echo dollar file done. So this should just list off our one file, and in fact there is our one file. Let's do it over here in rename.bash, pound bang bin slash bash, and for file in star.jpeg do done inside echo dollar file. Okay, so now if we say source rename, there's our rename. And there is a substitution mechanism inside of the variables where we can actually say, and you have to have curly braces here, 
two pounds, and the, the text you want to strip off the end comes after, so we can say .jpeg. So let's just try just that. And we'll scoot this down so you can see it. We're still over here. And we'll rerun that source, and it didn't work. Why not? There we go. Uh, pound pound takes it off the beginning and percent percent takes it off the end. Again you'll notice that with these funny syntax tricks even I who've done this for uh, about 15 years I've used bash and I still get tripped up by them each time. Okay so now we can add on our extension and we can say .png. We'll go ahead and save that. Source rename and now you can see that we've changed .jpg to .png. Now the the command we want to use is from the toolset Image Magic or the the fork of that, which is a different project with similar code, which is called con Graphics Magic, is convert. The convert command will change images in a whole number of ranges of ways. It'll resize them. It will also change the type of image format and do all kinds of fancy stuff. So if we save that one and we source it, we now are converting our file. But with the echo, this is a great way to debug scripts. You can have it do a loop or do a test and tell you what it would try to do without actually doing it. So let's delete our echo. Save that, control X, control S, source rename, and it didn't actually print anything. We should now see two different pictures. One is a JPEG that was our original and now a PNG which is our new version of that. And we can do XDG Oops. history pipe tail. So we can do XD, XDG dash open 2011 and now we can try PNG and see that we have a PNG version of our picture uh, looking out the Healy. That's it for today. I hope that gave you a sense of shell variables and with that you should see that you really would rather be working in a programming language like Python which will be much more uniform and less surprising when you get into the details of it. Thank you for joining me and I hope you come back for more.